I'm Seth Salinger, a senior associate with KPMG in the Minneapolis office, and I'm fascinated by the practice of transfer pricing and its impact on the global market. Join me this episode as I explore the transfer pricing world with specialists Jesse Coleman and Brittany Harden Tengue, who will explain the ins and outs of this niche practice where tax meets economics and what we're seeing this year and in the future. Hi, Brittany. Hi, Jesse. How are you doing today? Great. Excited to be here. I'm so happy to be here, Seth. Thanks for leading us on this journey today. Thanks, Brittany. I've been in the background for the last couple of years, and I'm excited to finally talk to our audience. Today, we're discussing the taxing times of transfer pricing, so a year-end wrap-up of 2024 and the key items for companies to consider as they enter 2025. Jesse, do you want to talk to us about one of the things you're seeing with FIDI and BEAT planning? So one big change that's coming up, and this actually is something that won't be expected until the end of 2025, so we've got some time here, but it is a really big change, is that some of the international tax provisions that transfer pricing practitioners focus on from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are expected to change. And all that expected change that taxpayers see are unfavorable. And while we also have this U.S election looming. So we don't really know if things will be changed. We do think that regardless of who wins in November, we're still likely expecting most of those changes. So you might ask, what are they related to? Number one would be the benefits taxpayers obtain from the foreign derived intangible income, which is popularly known as FIDI. And so that's going to decrease as the effective tax rate on FIDI increases from 13.1% to 16.4%. On guilty, which is also known as the global intangible low tax income, we expect that rate is going to increase. So from the current 10.5 to 13.1. We also see BEAT. So that's the base erosion and anti-abuse tax rate. And that's going to increase at the end of 2025 from 10% to 12.5%. Jesse, those are really interesting topics. We should have a separate episode on those. I think we're going to have probably a separate episode on each and every one of them. So we don't have time to delve into what they are, but I think the important thing for folks to know is there are changes that are expected. And while they're not expected until the end of 2025, it's important for folks to think about what they need now and any sort of planning they might want to do coming into the end of 2025. We're already seeing a lot of companies think about beat issues. So well before whatever happens or doesn't happen at the end of 2025. And what we're seeing is a lot of companies are coming to us. They're doing the modeling and they're seeing that in 2024 or 2025, they expect to be subject to beat. So one of the things we're doing for transfer pricing services, and we're actually doing a lot, a whole gambit of things for companies, but one thing I'd say that we see more on the transfer pricing side is looking at the expenses. So the expenses that might be beatable and seeing if those expenses would qualify for what would be called an SEM or services cost method exception. That's a great point, Jesse. While we know there is an upcoming election and the results of that could have an impact, there's no reason for us to think at this point that being proactive about beat, guilty, fitty, some of these other tax reforms is not a good use of your investment in time. Things are happening and it's best to get ahead of it, regardless of what the outcome of the election might be. It's possible there could be more tax reform coming down the pike. But at present, we have to operate under the assumption that this is the world we'll be in come 2026. Brittany, one of the other things that's been a hot topic this year and will continue going forward is the use of generative AI within tax and within the world in general. Can you speak a little to how you've seen generative AI affect the transfer pricing this year and how you see it's going to affect transfer pricing going forward? Absolutely, Seth. We are all just blue in the face from talking and thinking about Gen AI. And I think the question that we come around to and that I hear a lot of folks ruminate on is, so how do I actually use it? This is great. We know it's going to change the world, but how exactly? And how do we go from these lofty ideas to something that's going to benefit my here and now? 
What we have found is that successful execution is dependent upon mindful implementation. So we've been taking a process improvement based approach to try to think through where does it make sense to best use Gen AI so that you're not just doing something because you can. You're asking should we actually do this and is it going to be beneficial? And so the way we kind of walk through this from a process improvement perspective is through three primary phases. So we'll define, discover, and solve. So during define stage, we will be surveying existing processes to understand what's actually happening. While we're in the discovery phase, we'll evaluate whether the capabilities of Gen AI would accelerate or be beneficial to the operations, or if trying to figure out how to make it work would actually slow you down, and then ultimately solving to implement that and to make it actually happen. Keep in mind that one of the things that is also critical for success in this area is to have buy-in from all levels. So empowering those who are actually going to be utilizing Gen AI or making sure that Gen AI, which is generative in nature and thinks like humans and processes information faster than humans, is learning from the right people and that you have the support from leadership and management in actually investing the time to train Gen AI to make it work and behave faster and more efficiently. So I think that's the thing we also tend to forget about in this space is yes, Gen AI will ultimately make us all more efficient and faster, but the key is we need to recognize that there is some investment in figuring out how to best do that in the meantime. From a transfer pricing perspective, because there are so many things that Gen AI does that's similar to the way humans can think and produce content, it's important that we build effective guardrails. So if you're using it to help with the overwhelming task of organizing, understanding, and synthesizing functional interviews performed to support your functional write-ups, your economic analyses, and ultimately your transfer pricing results, making sure that you have a human in there to effectively make the correct judgment calls on some of those things is really going to be critical. Any questions, thoughts on that? <laughs> I really like how you explain the different process of how we're going to look at Gen AI and whether it's beneficial in the, the applications that we want to use it for. One of the other things that has been talked about until we're blue in the face is pillar one and amount B. Jesse, talk to us a little bit about strategies for future planning of pillar one and amount B. Mount B is the OECD inclusive framework project that aims to simplify and standardize application of the arm's length principle for baseline marketing and distribution activities. High level, where we are right now is we have a document that came out in February with an extra release that came out over the summer, and that is an optional amount B. Countries can decide to implement Amount B, and they can do so in a couple of different fashions. They can do so as of January 1st, 2025, so right around the corner. And there's still a lot of unknowns about which countries will implement Amount B and how they will implement. But the bottom line is, is that there is a pricing matrix which is out there we also understand there are a couple of countries, including the U.S., that are very interested in Amount B. So what we're suggesting is that businesses look at their operations if they are in the tangible goods business and they have tangible goods distributors. They should look at if they're in scope and if they are in scope, what that means in terms of the Amount B pricing in terms of planning, it's really just taking a step back and understanding how Amount B applies to your company. And if it does apply, just understand if there are any changes you think you should make. So does that application make sense? Does that margin you're seeing make sense? That's kind of where we are at Amount B right now. There is lots that is upcoming on Amount B, though. On the horizon, there is still the discussion of that potential mandatory amount B that companies would need to do. Unclear if that will ever come to fruition. On this kind of optional amount B world that we're in, we're still expecting some FAQs and some guidance. And we're also expecting countries to come forward and say what they're expecting to do. So I think there's a lot that's going to go on till the end of this year and going into next year here. Thank you, Jesse. That was incredibly insightful on Pillar 1 and Amount B. One of the other things that has been a topic of conversation this year has been Pillar 2 
uh, as a plug for future episodes of Exploring Transfer Pricing podcast, we're going to have a whole episode on Pillar 2. So we're not going to cover them in great depth today, but it's something on the horizon that you'll get the opportunity to listen to in the future. One of the other topics I wanted to cover today was changes in controversy and transfer pricing compliance. Brittany, could you talk us through some of the things that you're seeing going forward? Absolutely. So I don't think it's a secret. The transfer pricing litigation environment has been heating up for a little while, and it's not unreasonable to expect to potentially see more penalties enforcement, even for taxpayers who've prepared contemporaneous documentation. We know the IRS has invested more in staffing and in data analytics. It's crossing their T's and dotting those I's. It's football season, right? So the best offense is a good defense. Compliance feeds into controversy, and so making sure that taxpayers are also crossing their T's and dotting their I's on their transfer pricing documentation and being what we call, quote unquote, audit ready is the best way to sort of, at a minimum, begin to prepare yourself for this new environment. Right after you wrap up your year end, it's such a bad dash to get all of those documentation reports done, to do all those work papers, but preparing that audit ready file go a little bit further, run that extra distance to make sure that everything is wrapped up in a nice file. You've got all your background documentation and supporting work papers ready to go and reviewed so that whenever a tax authority comes in and asks to see it, you don't have to go back and revisit information. You know, you've got it ready to go. Just adding that and really building in that controversy readiness into your compliance exercise and into your compliance processes is really what we would like to see more and more taxpayers do going forward. And hopefully you've figured out the best way to use Gen AI, you know, in your transfer pricing processes so you're at more efficient and you're not as burnt out towards the end so you can actually pull these things together. That's just one element of it, right? There's other ways to achieve certainty through APAs, advanced pricing arrangements, or the OECD has their International Compliance Assurance Program, ICAP. So finding ways that you can get certainty to make your transfer pricing a little less infallible would be a good way to start thinking, which also brings to mind compliance, being aware of what the compliance regulations are around the world. And when we think about compliance trends over the past year and what to prepare for going forward, it would behoove me to not mention Brazil, which is quite notable. So as a reminder, Brazil adopted rules generally similar to the OECD guidelines as of January 1st, 2024. Taxpayers in Brazil that are responsible for transfer pricing documentation going forward are going to have completely different expectations on what they need to produce. So carefully documenting those changes, paying close attention, making sure that your policy is being implemented appropriately and that there are no surprises at the end of the year is a good thing to start to think about even now. And also just a plug for Brazil, mandatory adoption of the arm's length principles as of, as Brittany said, 1-1-2024. We're finding that there's always a surprise in Brazil. So if you haven't yet analyzed functions, assets, and risks and your intercompany transactions, I strongly suggest that you do so now and don't wait and need to make any sort of year-end adjustments. Great point, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany and Jesse, for all these great discussion points you talked about in our Taxing Times episode. Are there any last things that you'd like to remind our listeners about transfer pricing in the upcoming year? We're riding the wave. We know there's changes that are coming. This is a good time of year every year to reflect. So I'm glad that we're keeping this tradition of this Taxing Times podcast episode going because there's lots of things to be thinking about. We're at a junction where you can begin to think about how are we going to improve going forward? And we have all sorts of new regulations and rules and trends to be aware of, but we also have technology. And so figuring out how to make all of this work together is pretty critical. I think I have to say in closing that it just seems like things are going to keep changing. So maybe the only constant thing is that things are always in motion. And one of the things I just wanted to point out is that our episode here is based on an article that we published the last day of September. We intend to update and refresh that article to reflect just what those changes are as we enter into the new year. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Exploring Transfer Pricing. See you next time. Mm -hmm.